Hi, thanks for watching. This is Professor Ryan Paul, and this video is called The Music of Poetry. Uh, and in it, I'm going to talk about rhyme, alliteration, assonance, the sonic effects of poetry. So, as I said, rhyme, alliteration, assonance, these are sonic, these are aural, they have to do with how we hear poetry. So I want us to think about poetry as music, the musical aspects of poetry first, rather than some of the other things that we might more traditionally focus on. So we're, we're shifting our focus away from trying to find meaning, idea, trying to interpret what do these words mean, what's the story. Those things will be there in the in the back of our minds and we'll come back to it, but that's not our primary focus. These linguistic uh, language oriented concerns are not our primary focus if we're thinking about poetry as music. Instead of those kind of language oriented questions or meaning oriented questions, uh, we're looking more at patterning. Um, so repetition and disruption of sound patterns, of groups of sounds, and the similarity and difference between sounds. When are patterns carried out? When are patterns broken? When are the sounds the same? When are the sounds different? Within patterns, between individual sounds, uh, on multiple le levels. It's a little abstract at this point, but hopefully it'll make more sense later. So let's start with rhyme. Rhyme is something that we know when we hear it, but probably couldn't necessarily give a uh, definition, an explicit definition. This is uh, the most pertinent definition from the Oxford English Dictionary. It's when sounds correspond, there's a correspondence of sounds, uh, at the endings of words that have identical vowel sounds and, if they're there, identical final consonant, consonant sounds. So the words resonate or chime with one another because of this repeated vowel sounds, the sounds of the vowels, the O's, the E's, the I's, whatever vowels are there, they sound alike or identical. A slightly more focused definition of rhyme for our purposes is the artful use of sound or repeated sounds, similar sounds, in pursuit of poetic effects, whether those effects are emotional, aesthetic, intellectual, spiritual, whatever. And I say a poetic effect rather than uh, to communicate or to fulfill poetic purpose, because I think uh, it's important for us to, to understand or to, to look at poetry and any form of, of art as an attempt to create an effect for or within the reader, the audience. It's not, there's not a secret message that's being communicated. There's an effect that the poets try to have, and rhyme is, for the poet, one technique to do so. So we should ask ourselves, how does it work? What does it do? Not what does it mean? The meaning will come out of what work it does. So let's talk about some of those possible effects of rhyme. One is that it creates a, a consonance or harmony of sounds that's pleasing. We like when things sound good and the similarity or the identity, the repetition of identical sounds uh, can be pleasing. Uh, also, though, rhyme can be used to create discordance or cacophony, unpleasant sounds, um, harshness. And in fact, it's often necessary to create some sort of harshness in order for the harmony to have meaning. It highlights the pattern and craft. It, it makes us aware of how the poem is organized or how the words are organized and this, the artfulness of it. Um, and this isn't to say it's showing off, although certainly it could be in some cases, but just to uh, call attention to the way that the language has been crafted to create a certain poetic a series of poetic effects, um, that this work is, that the craft is doing something in the poem rather than just being, again, something to show off. Uh, rhyme aids memory. It's something that helps us remember a poem, and that's important. That's especially been important in the past, in uh, times when, you know, prior to the advent of printing and, and the widespread uh, uh, availability of writing technologies, uh, when things had to be remembered. Rhyme is a way to do that because it creates a, uh, a pattern of similarity, a pattern of identical sounds as kind of landmarks for the poet or the uh, speaker, the singer, to remember. Rhyme expresses mood or affect, emotion. It can do this through the consonants or the discordance of sounds discussed uh, a moment ago, right? 
pleasant sounds can can create a pleasant mood unpleasant sounds can create a, an unpleasant mood also just the the nature of the rhyme right if someone said it was very rude of us that was ludicrous that's a silly sounding uh, repetition of patterns and that expresses a kind of humor whereas other times rhymes can be um, harsh and uh, uh, can can create a sort of grimness through their sound right so mood very important part of their effect and uh, a fifth effect of rhyme out of no doubt many more is that it can embody content or express meaning as I said uh, a couple minutes ago that we're not focused on meaning so much today we're not looking at the words for what they mean primarily but rhyme does connect to meaning and so of course we always want to remember that um, the specific words that are rhymed can create you know by depending on the meaning of those words and the fact that we're called attention to them through rhyme that can be a way that the poet or speaker can communicate their ideas um, as well through the sound so the sound leads to the meaning so what do we do then when we're reading a poem and we hear something that rhymes um, since our focus is on uh, effect rather than meaning we are rather than interpreting that rhyme our first step is to describe it and there are a few features few uh, aspects of rhyme that we can use to describe the kind of rhyme it is um, and that's how we can think about that can be a first step in helping us think about what the rhyme does so first thing is just where does the rhyme occur most of the time when we think about rhyme it occurs at the end of the line um, but rhyme can occur in other places so are the rhyming words the rhyming sounds at the end of the line are they in the middle is one at the end is one in the middle are they at the beginning uh, that's the first first part after looking at where the rhyme occurs you want to think about uh, try to figure out how exact is the rhyme between words are the sounds exactly identical are they a little bit off are they eh, sort of close right there's a whole variety and this can also vary depending on differences in pronunciation sometimes if you're reading poetry that's uh, a couple hundred years old um, things that to us don't rhyme may have rhymed then and sometimes that can be difficult to determine but to the best that that you can how does how much uh how close are the rhymes in the way you hear the words finally uh you want to look at how many syllables are included in the rhyming sound is it one syllable is it two syllables is it uh root of us ludicrous that's three syllables right usually it's going to be one or two once you start getting to three or god forbid four it starts sounding really silly um, so how many syllables are included in the rhyming sound all right for a brief section review of what we've talked about so far we're focusing on musicality over meaning the musical aspects of it sound rather than what the words uh the ideas they're trying to communicate we're looking at effects over purpose that is we're looking for what are these settings trying to do rather than trying to find some hidden message and so we're describing where in the line does the rhyme occur how close are the rhyme sounds to each other and how many syllables are there let's take a quick break if needed okay let's look at some examples in what follows I'm mostly going to focus on end rhymes that is rhymes that occur at the end of lines uh, because that's what's most familiar and most common uh, in terms of poetry so that's what I'm going to talk about in terms of spending some extended time not just showing you end rhymes which are fairly obvious but uh, discussing what they do what the effects are and how we might use those effects to uh, help express the meaning of the poem to try to create uh, an interpretation through the use of sound I will give some examples of the other rhyme patterns um, I'll also give a brief discussion of uh, the kind of 
levels of similarity between rhymes and of the different syllable possibilities in terms of numbers of syllables, but I'm not going to focus on, on any of that in terms of interpretation, in terms of going through the effects, uh, but I will do that with end rhymes. Okay, let's take a look at some. Let's begin with one by John Donne from his poem, The Flea. It sucked me first and now sucks thee, and in this flea our two bloods mingled be. Uh, so, fairly obvious, the rhyme at the end, the and be, we can hear it, we can see it, it's not a difficult rhyme to, to locate, it's obviously an end rhyme. Of course, if we're paying attention, we also notice that the sounds the and be are not just rhymed with each other, they also resonate, echo the words me and flee earlier in the, in the two lines. So actually somewhat complex in that we have not only an end rhyme, but also an internal rhyme, but it's still all the same sound. Now let's think about the effect of the poem. And so we have to here rely on what we, what we know is happening in the poem. Um, if you haven't read The Flea yet, we're looking ahead here, but this is essentially a seduction poem. Um, to paraphrase it, the, the young man is trying to uh, convince his young female companion to spend the night with him, to sleep with him. And throughout the poem, he uses the flea as a metaphor, as a figure, uh, as part of his seduction ploy. He, compares it uh, to various things as a way to try to convince her to sleep with him. And here, if we want to paraphrase, he's saying, um, the flea bit me and it sucked my blood. And right now it's sucking your blood. And so inside the flea, our two bloods, the, both of our bloods are mingling together. They are mixed. And this fits into his seduction plan because, uh, again, to paraphrase, he's essentially saying, well, look, our bloods are already mingled in the flea, so whatever we're going to do, which is sexual intercourse, it's not that big a deal in comparison, right? We might as well do it. Um, so look at the rhymes and look at the progression of rhymes, me, the, right? The, the rhyme between the pronoun for himself and the pronoun for her connects them together. He's rhyming their names or their pronouns together. Um, flea, be, right? It also tells the story. Me, the, flea, be. We are together. We are unified. We are being has been uh, put together in the body of the flea. So the heavy repetition of the E sound works to emphasize subtly, or maybe not so subtly, um, his argument that this has already happened, so we might as well just go ahead, right? Me and thee, we be in the flea, to put it in a kind of silly way. Um, but yeah, so the, the rhyme emphasizes and it reinforces his argument that they are already together, that their bodies, um, whatever sexual consummation they, they may enact, has already in a sense happened, so they might as well just do it. From William Blake's The Tiger, and what shoulder and what art could twist the sinews of thy heart. Again, end rhyme, easy to see, uh, easy to hear, heart and art. We can hear that that uh, echo, the, the similarity or the identity between the sounds. And also, uh, important to note, very close, the words are very close. There's almost no difference between them. Um, to add to art, um, to get from one word to the next, you just add a breath. There's not actually any pitch there. The sound is just the sound of breath itself. So art, right? So that very closeness, even more close than the and be, flee and me. Um, in the previous example, very close sounds. Again, now let's, let's think about what this is doing, what bringing these sounds together does, how it um, might inform our uh, reactions or interpretations of the poem. Well, one, just the connection between heart and art is a very um, uh, uh, suggestive one, right? The idea that art is uh, an expression of our heart, of our internal uh, self, of our inner truths, right? So there's that kind of suggestive connection. Um, but let's think about also the context within the poem. Again, if, you, if you're if you not familiar with the tiger, this is uh, going to be looking ahead. But in this poem, the speaker is uh, looking at the tiger, the animal, and wondering, you know, where did this 
beautiful and terrifying creature come from? How could something like this exist? And he's speaking um, from a sort of, you know, uh, kind of uh, Judeo-Christian-ish perspective. And he's saying, looking at this terrifying creature of the tiger, and he essentially is asking, could the God that made all the beautiful and gentle things in the world, like lambs and babies and puppies, um, how is it that that God could also be responsible for this terrifying beast, this machine of death that is the tiger? The rhyme here, I think, reinforces the speaker's uh, profound crisis at trying to understand how the God that he, he has been taught about could create this. And so he's wondering, you know, what, where is the art? What kind of art, what kind of skill would it take to twist the sinews, to, to twist the muscles at the heart of this, you know, machine-like being this, this powerful beast um, to make a heart like that? Could we even call that an art to make something so deadly, so dangerous? Although, of course, there is a beauty in the, um, power and the sleekness of the of the tiger right and its deadliness there is a kind of beauty there so that paradox of being terrified but fascinated of wondering how could this even come about right what is the skill what is the the artistic vision that could create something like this and finally let's look at that closeness of the sounds heart and art that i pointed out earlier in the story of Genesis, God crafts man out of clay and then inspires him, that is, breathes into him. That's the literal meaning of inspiration. The breath of God is the breath of life. And here, the art of God breathes life into the heart of the tiger. The artistic vision becomes real through the act of breath, through the expelling of energy the transference of energy from one thing into another, from the creator into the created. Just as God breathes into Adam, God has breathed uh, uh, the divine art into the heart of the tiger, as the speaker has breathed life into his own question by asking it and saying it out loud. And as we breathe it when we say it, we breathe life, life into the, the poem and we ask the question again, how is it that a loving God could create this? How can we square our ideas of the goodness of the universe or that, that there is a, a good a purpose, a divine purpose or redeeming purpose in the universe with the horrors that we see around us? And so with Blake's brilliant um, use of rhyme and sound, he also gets us to, to think about the physicality of creation, even the physicality of the act of creating poetry. You are saying it, you are breathing it, your body is involved, you're writing it, your hand is involved. The heart expresses its art through the breath of the speaker, through the breath of the poet, through the breath of the reader who reads it out loud to themselves or even in their mind. There is an expression of energy. There is a breath of life in that. Um, and that's what takes, that's what gives life. That's what takes something from the inert and makes it real. Let's look at a few others. I won't go into quite as much detail on them. Um, this is from Emily Dickinson. A bird came down the walk. He did not know I saw. He bit an angle worm in halves and ate the fellow raw. Uh, so there's obviously some humor in this poem. There's, the, there's a kind of light rhythm to it. A bird came down the walk. He did not know I saw. There's a musicality to the rhythm, um, and that's enjoyable and, and humorous. And the description of the bird as just like a person going about its business and then eating the fellow, right? Describing the angleworm as a fellow. Um, uh, there's a kind of prim and properness to that that, that language that doesn't really match the action. So we have a sense of humor already just in looking at this scene. The end rhyme between saw and raw, I think it adds to the humorous effect by creating a kind of uh, effect of su surprise or mild shock. This bird is doing what 
It does, doing what birds normally do, going about its business, doesn't know it's being watched, uh, probably ne wouldn't necessarily even care if it was being watched. Um, it finds a worm and it eats it, just as a bird would expect uh, would be expected to do. But the speaker's describing the bird almost as if it were a person, kind of talking about it like she's watching a person walk down the street rather than a bird. And so when we get to the ate the fellow raw, um, that's a moment of surprise because now the bird behaves unhuman-like, although it's a moment of surprise that we shouldn't really be surprised about. It's a bird that acts like a bird. But if we're thinking about a bird like a human, then we're going to be surprised when it acts like a bird. Uh, and raw, right? We don't, humans don't eat raw food unless it's something that's specially prepared to be raw, but we, we cook meat, right? That's one of the things that divides humans uh, from animals, supposedly, according to some anthropological theories, right? So um, there's a shock of recognition that this bird is a bird because it's eating something raw. I've been looking at the bird like a um, human and I saw something and I saw the rawness of, of the animal. I saw the animal that I'm really looking at for a brief moment, not the, the way I'm imagining it to be. Here's one from Henry Vaughan, 17th century poet, his poem, The World. It begins, I saw eternity the other night, like a great ring of pure and endless light, all calm as it was bright. So the rhyme here is, is fairly obvious, night, light, bright. Um, and we also notice that there's a related relationship between the meanings of these words uh, in ways that some of the other rhymes we've looked at, the words didn't necessarily have any uh, relationship in terms of their meaning. But night and light and bright, they all are about um, lightness, right? They're all about the presence or absence of sunlight uh, or some form of, of light. So at nighttime, the sun is set. Uh, there's maybe a little bit of light from the moon and stars, but it's a time of darkness. Um, light is a source of vision, is what we can see, and brightness, right? If it's if uh, it emphasizes the intensity of the light. This isn't a dim light, but this is a brightness. The effect of this of these rhymes. Let's think about what the speaker's saying. They're talking about seeing eternity, um, which is something that defies uh, conventional explanation. It defies. Um, our normal everyday experience, right? To see eternity, that's a like a religious experience. Um, so it's a moment we might say of, of enlightenment, of being illuminated, of seeing beyond the shadows, the physical uh, uh, illusions of our world to see everything at once. So it's a kind of illumination or enlightenment. And the words, the rhyme words carry the story. It was night, and then there was light and it was bright, right? Uh, it's, it's simple and it's almost silly, but it's a very powerful conveying of this experience of being enlightened, of going from darkness, of seeing nothing, to then this light that brightens everything around you and bathes you in an intensity of truth, right? So here, it's not only the sounds, but the, the, the meanings of the words carry the story through that connection, even without the rest of the lines, we, we can get the essence of the story. He's going from darkness into brightness, from ignorance into enlightenment. Now I'm just going to give some examples without um, a lot of discussion of some other forms of rhyme. So here's internal rhyme. This is when the rhyme occurs um, not between different lines, but within the line itself. So we already saw an example of this with um, John Dunn's The Flea, uh, where internal rhyme and end rhyme were com combined. This is just internal rhyme. So, ah, country guy, the hour is nigh, the sun has left the lee. The orange flower perfumes the bower, the breeze is on the sea. The lark his lay who thrilled all day, sits hushed his partner nigh. Breeze, bird, and flower confess the hour, but where is country guy? 
Um, so you've got, you can hear the effect. It gives it a very musical effect. It sounds like a song, right? Um, and it gives a kind of uh, a, a regular rhythm. The orange flower perfumes the bower. The lark his lay who thrilled all day, right? So the rhyme adds to the, the adds a kind of strength or emphasis to the rhythm of the poem. Um, and the rhymes, the internal rhymes tie the images together. The orange flower in the bower, the lark whose song, that is lay, um, and the daytime, the flower and the hour, right? So it, it really tightens the connection, I think, between the images in the lines. Here's another one from a poem that's probably familiar to many of you, Edgar Allan Poe's The Raven. Once upon a midnight dreary, while I pondered weak and weary, over many a quaint and curious volume of forgotten lore, while I nodded, nearly napping, suddenly there came a tapping, as of someone gently rapping, rapping at my chamber door. "'Tis some visitor,' I muttered, tapping at my chamber door, only this and nothing more." There's obviously a lot of a lot more rhyme here. There's the end rhymes, but just focusing on the internal rhyme, dreary, weary, napping, tapping, rapping, tapping. Um, here, again, the effect is to express something of the mood, dreary, weary, those both those words have a kind of um, depression in the middle of them and they, they, they ling linger outwards when you say them. Um, and that's his, his mood at the moment. It's, he's dreary, he's tired, everything's just kind of sinking and sagging. But then the raven, which, if you know the poem, becomes his, uh, uh, you know, persecutor, his tormentor, because of this regular repetition of just noise that becomes um, ultimately meaningless, napping, tapping, rapping, rapping, tapping. Right? We get a almost a foreshadowing of that. We get that sound of how his sleep is disturbed by this repetitive sound that's going to come back again and again and again and again to disturb him to break into his moment of peace so the sound um here again communicates the mood both of the speaker and of the the scene in general and of course in addition to uh end rhyme and internal rhyme there's all sorts of other patterns of rhyme so here on this, the next few, few slides, um, I've got essentially the same statement, the same idea or image rewritten in a bunch of different forms um, to put the rhymes in different places and create different patterns. And I didn't write these originally. I don't remember where I got this from. Uh, if, you, if you know, let me know, because I don't remember where I found these rhymes. But um, the idea here is I want you to see how and hear how um, just putting reorganizing the sounds can create a different effect even if it's the same image the same action being described different aspects of that scene are going to be emphasized so first linked rhyme the bell is heard and the song is sung flung upon the morning air right there's so the link is between the end of one line and the beginning of the next and if we think about the way the action is being described, the idea of the song flinging this, uh, itself or the bell flinging the song out onto the air, that's emphasized by the, the pause at the end of one line and the beginning of the next, which then continues that sound and launches it off. The bell is heard and the song is sung flung upon the morning air, right? The flung enacts that, that second rhyme, uh, enacts the action of flinging the song out into the morning air, into the sound, into the line. Now interlaced rhyme, where the rhyming sounds are uh, in the middle of two different lines. The song is sung and the bell is heard. It is flung upon the air. So here I think the emphasis is on the act it, that this is happening right now. We're seeing this kind of almost in a freeze frame. Um, think about the moment when you are flinging out a, sh a sheet, a bed sheet to put on your bed, right? That's been folded up and you have to cast it out. And there's that moment where it's hanging there uh, on the air, almost not moving, just a brief, uh, f you know, microsecond where it's hanging in the air. And so we see the song sung, the bell heard. These things are happening right now. Um, it is flung upon the air that the way the, the rhythm of the line works causes us to pause a moment. It is flung upon the air. So it's hanging there at that moment. We can see the uh, experience, the song in the moment of its expansion, in the moment of its uh, expression, like again, a freeze frame, a kind of audio freeze frame. 
cross rhyme. So here, the literally, it cuts across. The rhyme at the end of one line uh, rhymes with a sound in the middle of, of another. The bell is heard and the song is sung. The sound is flung on the morning air. Here, notice the sense of movement. We've got a sequence. The bell is heard, the song is sung, the sound is flung on the morning air. And then once it's out on the air, then it's out to, to spread. Uh, the sound spreads out. So I think the cross rhyme here creates a sense of this movement and that we are, um, whereas if interlaced rhyme was, uh, we're seeing it pause, here in the cross rhyme, we see the motion. We see the motion of the bell and the sound expanding out and then flinging out and then even beyond the flinging into the morning air, right? So the cross rhyme here creates a sense of motion. Head rhyme, the opposite of end rhyme, where the rhymes are at the beginning of the, the different lines. Sung is the song of the ringing bell flung upon the morning air. Uh, I think the head rhyme gives a kind of stateliness to it or um, uh, emphasis right at the beginning. Sung is the song of the ringing bell flung upon the morning air. So that beginning is really, is really emphasized. The start of the line is heavy because both the emphasis on the words and the echo of the sounds forces us to hear that beginning, right? So this is the mo the moment almost when the bell is being rung um, that we're focusing on here. I think in this in this moment, um, fitting because we're it's it's head rhyme. It's at the beginning, so it's focusing our attention on the beginning of the moment that's being described. Finally, apocopated rhyme. Uh, apocopate means to to cut off the end of a word. Um, so here, notice that it's, it's at the end of the lines, but the rhyme is created by cutting the words off at the ending. Both mourn and born um, are words that uh, the ending is cut off, or at least in, in the first instance, the words are, is divided. The bells were ringing on the morning that the song of the sun was born. Um, it's a little awkward. I don't know how I would really describe the effect here. I think perhaps I would say that, uh, at least in this line, uh, this particular image and the way the um, rhyme works and the way the rhythm works, the sounds, it almost creates the effect of like the constant ringing. The bells were ringing on the morning that the song of the sun was born. Um, I, I don't know, I, I, I hear like the bells clanging over and over again in the sharp repetitions of the ng sounds, ng, ng, morn, ng, song, sun, born, right? So in addition to the rhyme at the end, there's a lot of other echoes here that kind of create that, you know, one sound cutting off the next before uh, one sound even gets to finish, the next one is there, like a bell that's being rung over and over and over again. Okay, now I'm going to run through um, just some of the other aspects of rhyme. Again, not talking too much about um, them in detail, but just pointing them out. So we have true rhyme or full, exact, perfect rhyme. This is when the sounds rhyme exactly. Um, so here's some examples. He watches me for mother and will turn the beer and baby carriage where I burn. Sure twas not, e sure twas not ever thus, nor are we told fables of women that excelled of old. Unreal, you realize yourself in me. I thought your coldness was my property. That fish that is not catched thereby, alas, is wiser far than I. And, you know, many of the others that we've looked at, they were mostly perfect rhymes. So it's when this, just when the sound is identical. Now, multisyllabic rhymes, right? Often, most often it's a single syllable that rhymes, night, light, flea, bee. But sometimes multiple syllables can rhyme, can have the same sounds. Thinning, winning, devotion, ocean, fated, liberated. And notice it doesn't have to be the whole word. It's just, you can be part of one word with part of another word. Deference, reference, busily, fizzily, posterity, rarity. These are the triple rhymes. And so with triple rhymes, you start getting really sort of awkward and, and oftentimes it sounds very comical. So they're usually used for uh, somewhat of an ironic or comical uh, uh, sound, although not all the time when the rhyming sounds are not identical, 
They can be slant or off rhyme, partial rhyme, near rhyme. There's a lot of different terms, and sometimes there are uh, people will differentiate even among these terms, but I'm not so concerned with that. But just the idea that you notice whether the sounds are identical or not. Sometimes that's a result of changes in pronunciation, right? like the first one here, worm shall try that long preserved virginity. That may very well be a result of the fact that the poem was written, um, you know, almost 400 years ago. Uh, but the sounds are similar. They're just not exact. From the Emily Dickinson poem, A Bird Came Down the Walk at the very end, um, she talks about the, the butterfly's wings or the bird's wings are too silver for a seam or butterflies off banks of noon leap plashless as they swim. So seam, swim, they're close, but they're not exactly the same, right? So there's a connection, but there's also a little bit of dissonance or difference. On what seraphic pinions shall we move and view the landscapes in the realms above? Again, perhaps a result of historical difference, but just the rhyme's a little bit off. And sometimes we have things that where there's almost no actual sound rhyme. It's just a sight or eye rhyme. That is, the words look similar. S similar. Uh, rough, through. They don't sound anything alike, but they look alike. Clone, none. That could actually maybe even be qualified as a slant rhyme, but certainly rough and through are, uh, they don't rhyme at all. They just look the same. So that's a sight rhyme or an eye rhyme. And just to briefly talk a little bit about some other sonic effects. Uh, alliteration. This is the repetition of initial, uh, usually initial consonant sounds within a phrase or line. So from Theme from English B by Langston Hughes. I like a pipe for a Christmas present or records, Bessie Bop or Bach. Right? Especially in that second line, Bessie Bop, Bach. Three different musical styles. But the alliteration of sounds brings them together, connects them even though they are different and they have a different rhythm and different sound. Um, and part of what that poem about, arguably, is about connection across difference between the uh, African-American student and his white professor. From Wallace Stevens' poem, Of Mere Being, the birds fire-fangled feathers dangle down. I think here the fa 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 da da creates um, a sense of downward movement uh, in, the, in the image that follows the image of the image of the, the eye that follows your, the feathers that are dangling down off the bird. And from Edgar Allan Poe's Sonnet to Science, Hast thou not dragged Diana from her car and driven the hamadryad from the wood to seek a shelter in some happier star? Uh, here, I think the, the sounds, um, the repetition of sounds emphasizes the harshness of the action that he's describing. But again, my purpose here is just really mostly to point out alliteration as another sonic effect that we can analyze, we can uh, uh, describe and analyze in just the same way that we've done rhyme. Assonance, like alliteration, is a repetition within a phrase or line, but of vowel sounds, um, and, but not at the ends of words, as in rhyme. Um, so here are just some examples from poems, and these are taken out of context, so the lines don't necessarily mean much to you, but you can just hear the sounds. Not to the sensual ear, but more endeared, pipe to the spirit, ditties of no tone. Oh, the one life within us and abroad, which meets all motion and becomes its soul. When the brokers are roaring like beasts on the floor of the bourse. Right, so it's a repetition of sounds. And like I said, I'm not going to spend uh, time discussing what uh, the effects might be here. But just as with alliteration, as with all different forms of rhyme, looking at the patterns, looking at the way sounds are repeated, looking at the w where patterns are broken, and where there's difference inserted, that can be a way to, uh, it draws our attention to different ideas, different images, forces us to kind of see how the sounds um, are part of the mood and expression of the poem itself. So let's review. Um, we've been talking about analyzing sound or, or listening for the music in poetry, um, primarily rhyme, but also alliteration, assonance, these other forms of, of aural or sonic effects. So we're looking for patterns and disruptions in patterns, right? Uh, the play of similarity and difference, how there might be patterns of similar signs, sounds, then disrupted with something different uh, in an unexpected moment. So we look to that first before we start thinking about, you know, meaning. Um, we're just trying to describe what's happening and how the similar and different sounds are arranged and organized. 
Um, and this can lead us to thinking about unexpected juxtapositions. That is words and ideas that are linked by sound, but that we might not think about in conjunction with each other. How does the sound connect different ideas or sometimes um, force us to, to be aware of contradictions or, or conflicts? And uh, finally, the musical effect, the rhythm, the mood. What does the sound do? How does it express the feel of the poem? How does it replicate in kind of an abstract musical form what's going on, what the speaker is saying or experiencing? These are the kind of three, I'd say the three main takeaways or the three things to, to think about when you're reading a poem, hopefully reading it out loud and listening to how sound works on the level of uh, artistry. All right, that is it for this lecture. Uh, if you have any questions, you can feel free to comment below. If you're one of my students, uh, please email me. Uh, I hope it was valuable and I will see you in the next video. Take care.